السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam His entire household and all his companions We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless them and to bless every single one of us Ameen my brothers and sisters in Islam, Islam is a very beautiful religion. It has so much beauty in it that a person who is not within the fold of Islam, if they were genuinely searching for what was true, the moment they enter the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the place of worship of the Muslims or what is known as a masjid, they would immediately feel a sense of peace due to the beauty of the surroundings and the serenity within it. And this itself is a sign that the place of worship is known as the house of Allah, the house of the Almighty. It does not belong to me. It does not belong to you or anyone else. It belongs to the Almighty, even though you and I might have been involved in perhaps contributing towards the building of the structure or contributing in any other way to that beautiful building. However, that feeling is just an external feeling that seeps to the uh, inner, inner part of the human being. But if we were to look deeper, it actually emulates from the teachings of this beautiful religion. A believer should be one who is in constant happiness one who is content upon the condition that the Almighty has kept him or her upon. And this is why Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the messenger, peace be upon him, has said something very, very powerful. He says, عَجَبًا لِأَمْرِ الْمُؤْمِنِ فَإِنَّ أَمْرَهُ كُلَّهُ لَهُ خَيْرٍ The affairs of a true believer are amazing. They are unique. In what sense? Because he says all the affairs of a true believer are good for the believer. When goodness comes in the direction of a believer, he or she is thankful. So that is better for him. And when evil, or should I say, when difficulty, calamity strikes, then a believer is patient. A believer is one who uh, relates that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and understands the nature of life and the tests that will come within life. It is impossible to live a life that will be void of tests from the Almighty. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَحَسِبَ النَّاسُ أَيُتْرَكُوا أَنْ يَقُولُوا آمَنَّا وَهُمْ لَا يُفْتَنُونَ Do people think that it is enough for them to say, we are believers and then they are not tested? Indeed, those before them were tested as well. Everyone is going to be tested. So when a person is tested, if they have belief in them, they will automatically be content with the portion that has been uh, apportioned for them by the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. But getting to the prime beauty of Islam, one of the most important aspects that we find is so beautiful about this amazing religion is the fact that every one of us has a direct link with the Almighty. With, with your maker, you have a direct link. When you raise your hands, you say, Oh Allah, when you start your prayer, it is a plug in between you and the one who made you. So you do not worship a stick or a stone or a human being or a prophet or a saint or a grave. No, the beauty of Islam is when you would like to worship, you worship the one who made you directly, completely, no matter who you are. Nobody can say, I am unclean, I am unfit, I am actually, I have committed so much sin that I am uh, a right off, whereby now I'm thrown away. No, the beauty of Islam, no matter what you've done, if the devil has succeeded to get control of you for 20 years to 70 years, however long, the moment you turn back to your maker and say, oh, my maker that is the moment of mercy and the moment of blessedness and that is when if you were to seek forgiveness correctly automatically everything that you've done would be wiped out in terms of evil and the good that you've done would actually carry through and this is why when a person accepts Islam 
Say for example, someone declares their shahada or they declare their faith. Uh, what would happen? The hadith says, Inna al-Islam yajubbu ma qabla. Islam deletes what happened before uh, the date or the time of the, the declaration of the faith, but it only deletes the evil. As for the good, the good carries through. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us. He does not waste our good deeds and he does not waste the goodness of an individual. When we ask for, ta- for forgiveness, when we repent, when we engage in what is known as tawbah, automatically whatever bad we've done in the past is actually forgiven. And not just forgiven. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Many sins are being made mention of, and immediately after that, the Almighty says, Except for those, meaning people would be punished, except for those who seek forgiveness. And after their repentance, they do good deeds for them. The bad that they've done will be converted into good on the right side of the scale. So a person who's done bad for so many years, if they fulfill two conditions, that bad will be converted into good in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and come to assist them on the day of judgment, the day of reckoning, the day that you and I will all need the mercy of the Almighty. May He grant that to us. So, for example, or what are these two conditions? One is a person who has committed sin needs to admit, regret, ask Allah's forgiveness, promise not to do it again. That is known as tawbah or repentance. So you've asked Allah's forgiveness, number one. Number two is after that forgiveness, don't allow the devil to catch you once again, but rather change your life. Turn, turn a good turning to the Almighty. So if you've repented from your bad or the past that you have had, and from the time of repentance, you've only done good, Allah says, then you deserve, you really deserve to have the bad you've done converted into good. And that would come to your assistance. It would be uh, for you and not against you. This is something unique in Islam. You know, if you ask someone forgiveness, Uh, They may say, okay, it's fine if you've done something wrong to someone, depending on the level of that wrong. With Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no matter what the level of wrong is, if you ask him forgiveness in the correct way, he will forgive you. And this is why even those who associate partners with Allah, which is considered one of the biggest possible crimes that a person can commit, and that is known as shirk, or to associate partners with the Almighty, to worship with the Almighty something else, someone else, or to worship several deities besides the Almighty. All this is considered wrong. It's a sin of the highest degree. But if a person repents from that sin during their lifetime, they definitely have the hope of the Almighty and the Almighty will indeed forgive them. There is no doubt that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is most forgiving, most merciful. So if a person seeks forgiveness and after that they continue doing good deeds, they definitely will achieve something very, very great. And this is the beauty of Islam. Now, sometimes you have people who would go to a pious person and they would say, or someone whom they think and they believe is pious, is, is good perhaps, you know, a person who prays often, a person who really tries to worship Allah uh, from what we can see. And someone would go to them and say, please pray for me. That is the limit that you're allowed to go to. Beyond that, you're not allowed. So I can come to someone, the maximum I could do is to say, my brother, pray for me. Ask Allah to guide me. I need to ask Allah as well. But it's not wrong to ask someone whom we consider to be a decent person to say, my brother or my sister, pray for me. That's the limit. Beyond that, I cannot go. Because the beauty of Islam is such that we will never ever be able to know the exact extent of the relationship between an individual and his or her maker. This is why to judge people and to just pass judgment, this one is good and this one is bad, Based on what? Subhanallah, you don't know the detailed link of that individual with the Almighty. People struggle. People struggle to earn the connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this struggle is only known by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you were fortunate enough to have been born in a home where everyone was practicing, it would have been easier for you to practice. And therefore, the, uh, the reward you would get would be great. 
But who knows the reward of a person who is practicing yet their entire home is full of people who are not practicing. Perhaps the difficulty that they are going through is far greater and therefore Allah gives them a double or triple, quadruple reward and that's the Almighty. He knows and He knows the level. So what might be seeming to be a person who's not doing as well in the eyes of Allah may be a person who's doing much better than one who's putting no effort into worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Although that one is considered fortunate because they've been brought up in an environment, but the other one does not lose any droplet of, of that fortune as well. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is definitely the one who knows your struggle and he will reward you in accordance to your struggle and his mercy at the same time. So this is part of the beauty of Islam. We worship Allah directly. That is my maker. I say Allahu Akbar. Allah is the greatest. My maker is the greatest. The one who made me is owed my worship. No one else. None is worthy of worship besides my maker. This is why to enter the fold of Islam, what do I need to do? There is a declaration. I say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. Or I say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. I bear witness there is none worthy of worship besides my maker. How then can I render an act of worship to someone besides that maker? I would be negating that very statement of mine. So this is why let's be careful, my brothers and sisters. Let's understand this beautiful religion and the fact that you do have died direct access to your maker. And this is why one of the most beautiful verses in the Quran in terms of repentance is a verse that we find in Surah Zumar where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ O Messenger, peace be upon him, meaning referring to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Say to my worshippers, tell my worshippers, those who have transgressed against themselves, not to lose hope in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No matter what you've done, never lose hope. Don't think that, you know what, it's too late. Perhaps I have done a little bit more than what the mercy of Allah can encompass. No ways. Allah says, وَرَحْمَتِي وَسِعَتْ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ Indeed, my mercy has encompassed absolutely everything. So understand that that is the Almighty, the most merciful. You know, when we start our prayer, we have to read a surah or a chapter of the Quran that all of us have to memorize off by heart. And that's the beauty of Islam. Some people say, why do I need to memorize this thing in Arabic? Why don't I just read this in the English language? My brother, my sister, you should know the English. You should know the translation of it. But when it comes to the units of prayer, of the five daily prayers, you will have to recite that in the Arabic language. And one of the reasons is... There are many reasons obviously, but one of them is that you would have contributed towards the preservation of the book in the form that it was revealed. And that is in the form of the Arabic language exactly as given to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So even if you have entered the fold of Islam today, tonight, it would be important for you as soon as possible to learn off by heart. Whether you immediately understand it or not, you would have to inshallah, like we are encouraging you to look into the meaning and to understand it. But whether you understood it or not, you would have to memorize a short portion of the Quran. So tomorrow you would be able to say, I am able to read part of the revelation exactly as it was revealed. Subhanallah. And this is one of the reasons why the Quran is exactly in the form it is from the day it was revealed to this particular day up to the end of time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafidun. We have indeed revealed this remembrance, the Quran, and we will ensure its preservation and its protection. That is something unique. It's part of the beauty of Islam. The other scriptures have been lost. 
the other scriptures have been tampered with, or the other scriptures, there are arguments regarding their authenticity amongst the very followers of the same scriptures. But when it comes to the Quran, no debate, no argument. It's a beauty. It's something grand, great. And you as a person who might have accepted Islam today, it's your duty to memorize a short portion which will not take you more than a day. Subhanallah. Amazing. So when we start off this in the prayer, it's a beautiful surah, the opening of the Quran. Have you ever asked yourself, how does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala start off this Quran in terms of the order that we have it today? You find the first surah known as the opening chapter, Al-Fatiha, that the opening chapter. And the verses that we all would know of by heart, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. And before that, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of the Almighty, in the name of Allah. And what are the qualities he chose to mention at that opening juncture? What did what does he say? He says, Ar Rahmanir Rahim. Bismillah. In the name of Allah, who is most forgiving, most merciful, or most merciful in a specialized way? Most merciful in a general way, most merciful in a specialized way. Who has a mercy on entire creation and a special mercy upon those who believe. The term Rahim refers to the special mercy of the Almighty connected to those who believe. It's amazing. And yet Allah has mercy even upon those who don't believe. Have you known that? Allah has mercy even upon animals. Allah has mercy upon everything that He has created. He is the most merciful. That is the beauty of Islam. And this is why when Ibrahim alayhi salam made the dua, he asked Allah, the Prophet Abraham, may peace be upon him, asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, I ask you to grant goodness and sustenance to myself and my progeny, those from amongst them who believe. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, not only will I grant sustenance to those who believe, but even those who disbelieve, I will grant them sustenance for a fixed period of time. Subhanallah, amazing. In Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of it. And this shows the mercy of Allah, that Allah has had mercy on us and He has mercy on all other human beings at the same time. But the beauty of it, the beauty of it is that these are the opening verses of the Quran, talking of the mercy of Allah. It gives us so much of hope. It gives us so much of uh, a good feeling within us to say, I have a link with my own maker and I am hopeful that he will have mercy on me the day he takes me away. So this is why we say, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, in the name of Allah, most merciful, most merciful, most beneficent, most merciful. Similarly, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, all praise is due to Allah. All praise is due to Allah. Lord of the worlds. This is how he starts. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. The most beneficent, the most merciful. The one who is full of mercy, all sorts of mercy. It is reported by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Almighty, divided mercy into 100 different categories or 100 portions. And he kept 99 portions with him and he released or he sent down to earth only one portion of his mercy. So all the mercy that we see on earth between us, you know, with our own children and with everyone else and with fellow human beings and so on, the mercy that we are seeing manifest, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we see manifest in this world is only one small portion from 100 portions of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at this. Look at what type of hope Allah is instilling in us. My brothers and sisters, never lose hope in the mercy of your maker. Never lose hope in the mercy of your maker. Understand that the Almighty is high above. He is the most merciful. So the concept of Godhood in Islam is very unique. It signifies the beauty of this faith where every one of us is uniquely loved by our own maker. And he is waiting for us completely. He is waiting for us to turn to him. Do you know the hadith says, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has made it quite clear. He says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ تَعَالَى يَبْسُطُ يَدَهُ بِاللَّيْلِ لِيَتُوبَ مُسِيءُ النَّهَارِ وَيَبْسُطُ يَدَهُ بِالنَّهَارِ لِيَتُوبَ مُسِيءُ اللَّيْلِ حَتَّى تَطْلُعَ الشَّمْسُ مِنْ مَغْرِبِهَا Every day, 
The Almighty stretches his hand in order to forgive those who have sinned by the night. And every night he stretches his hand in order to forgive those who have sinned during the day. Until the last, until the end of times, until the sun rises from the west rather than the east. And that's one of the major signs of the, the hour. So that is the mercy of Allah. Imagine how should I be feeling if I know that the one who made me is so merciful. He loves me. He knows the nature upon which man has been created. And this is why one of the most beautiful elements of Islam is the issue of gender equality. It is unique. Islam takes into consideration the differences in the physical features or the physical differences in terms of the creation of male and female when it addresses the issue of the role of the male and the female. So it would be wrong for me to say that, you know what, I need to consider this gender equality such that I must not take into consideration the fact that we are physically different. If that's the case, I'm being foolish. But that should not make me oppress the other. I need to understand Islam is unique when it comes to access to my maker. Absolute equality. Absolute meaning in the same way a male has access to his maker, so does a female. When it comes to the different chores and the different issues, the, the, when it comes to, the, for example, the status, you sometimes have certain, in certain aspects, a female has been raised. She is the one who's able to give birth. She is the one who's able to breastfeed the children. She is the one who's made to go through certain aspects through her health by the Almighty. If she is patient upon that physical condition that the Almighty has kept her, considering that, yes, she is physically different, then inshallah she will be able to achieve a rank through certain channels that a male cannot use because he doesn't have them. He doesn't have the, the honor of giving birth, subhanallah. That's Allah, it's his decision and his decision is final. And at the same time, when it comes to the male, the characteristics of a male are different. So taking that into consideration, so the Quran has been revealed and the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the instruction of the Almighty. Something unique also with this beautiful faith of Islam is the fact that none of us have chosen where we want to be born, who our parents will be, what our nationality will be, what our color will be, the size we will be. All that is determined by the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's determined by your maker. And Allah takes that into consideration, makes it very clear because He is the one who chose it and decided it. And therefore, in Allah Ta'ala, لا ينظر إلى صوركم ولا إلى أجسامكم ولكن ينظر إلى قلوبكم وأعمالكم Allah, as what Muhammad, peace be upon him, has told us, Allah Almighty does not look at your outward shape. He does not look at your body, your features. He does not look at that. He looks at your heart. He looks at your deeds. So Allah will judge you based on your heart and your deeds. But He will never judge you based on your nationality, based on your, your height, based on your color, based on where you come from. And for this reason, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, made it very clear by saying, لا فضل لعربي على عجمي ولا لعجمي على عربي ولا لأبيض على أسود إلا بالتقوى. He says there is no virtue of an Arab upon a non-Arab or a non-Arab upon an Arab or a white upon a black except by the consciousness of Allah. Whoever is closer to the Almighty, whoever has a better link with the Almighty, is a more noble person, is a higher person in the eyes of the Almighty. This was made clear by Muhammad, may peace be upon him. And this is why you have from amongst the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, those few who belong to different races, who came from different parts of the world, and they were treated with utmost respect. Wherever anyone had uttered a single word in terms of uh, that which may be derogatory against any one of those, immediately the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, made it clear that this is unacceptable. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to understand that every one of us are the children of Adam. Every one of us are the children of Adam. Allah has created us from Adam and Hawa, may peace be upon them. Hawa, Eve, may peace be upon her. We have been created from those two, so we are all somehow related. Doesn't it make you feel good? It makes me definitely feel good to know that I'm related to all of you here. Even though I come from somewhere else, perhaps on the globe, but my roots are the same. So I should never for a moment think that, you know what? I'm better than you because of my color, because of my size, because of my shape, because of this and that. No, not at all. This is the beauty of Islam. 
So one might say, but sometimes we do have people who behave in this way. To be honest, it's not from Islam. It is actually their own weakness. It's got nothing to do with religion. So many actions that people engage in that are far away from the teachings of the religion, and yet people blame the religion. It's actually foolish. When a person steals, when a person engages in uh, behavior that's unacceptable, the fact that they belong to a specific religion is actually not that which should make the religion look bad, it's actually the individual. Go back to the religion and the teachings of the religion, you will find that that type of behavior is unacceptable. So this is why we say, if someone has uh, engaged in something unacceptable, if someone has perhaps shown traits of racism, it's not based on Islam at all. The beautiful religion tells us quite clearly to embrace every human being, to embrace those, even those, for example, who are non-believers, what is our duty towards them? And this is something unique in Islam. Certain faiths, they have a closed shop, which means we don't want anyone to enter the faith here. This is just us and it's ours. That's it. You stay where you are, we stay where we are. In Islam, we actually have a totally opposite outlook. You know, the Prophet ﷺ was faced with people who fought him. And one of the days, Ali ibn Abi Talib عنه, was entering one of the forts where the people had fought Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So as he was entering, and this was warfare, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stops him and says, Ya Ali, O oh Ali, may peace and blessings be upon them all. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, لَأَنْ يَهْدِيَ اللَّهُ بِكَ رَجُلًا وَاحِدًا خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِنْ حُمُرِ النَّعَمِ You need to know one thing. If Allah has used you to guide a single person, it's better for you than the red camel. The red camel meaning something very expensive. You know, it's like the vehicles we have today. The most expensive from amongst those vehicles, you know, each one would probably like a different car. Better than that car, better than the vehicle, better than the conveyance, better than anything monetary or material that this world can offer you is when Allah has used you to bring forth even a single human being. Here we are talking of enemies, those who are fighting the Muslimin. What about those who are not really fighting us? They're just general non-Muslims. We need to correct the understanding of our relationship with those type of people. That we need to lead a life in such a way that the, the, the way we talk to them, they would automatically know that subhanallah, this is a beautiful faith. These people are calm, these people are truthful, they are correct, they respect all human beings. I want to be a part of this. It's such a unique way of worship. You know, when something important is happening, what is overriding is the link with the maker. So I would perhaps say, listen my brother, listen my sister, I will be with you in two minutes if you allow me to say my prayer. Don't be shy, that's the beauty of Islam. Allah has kept the actions of prayer so unique. That on its own, when people watch you pray, and if they're not Muslim, they would feel immediately this is something that brings about so much of peace. Imagine, take a look at prayer five times a day. We have the early morning prayer, which, which wakes us up from our sleep, subhanallah, at a time when it would be the healthiest from a medical perspective to get up. So not only would we be serving our health, mashallah, you know, doing some goodness to our own health, but over and above that, we are actually answering the command of the Almighty willfully, wholeheartedly, willingly, achieving not only spiritual and religious benefit, but even from a health perspective, mashallah, we achieve so much because of the timing of that beautiful prayer. That's the beauty of Islam. You know, you've had a day, subhanallah, you worked all morning and in the morning, the concentration levels are slightly higher. So therefore, even when it comes to the schools and various other uh, departments, you have the morning session is longer than the afternoon session. So if you take a look at the salawat, the gap between the fajr, the morning prayer and the midday prayer is far greater than the gap between that of the, the midday prayer and the late afternoon prayer or the afternoon prayer. Amazing. So you plug out or should I say you remove the plug for a moment. You actually uh, come out of your routine, you wash yourself with good water, mashallah, preferably, you know, clean water, obviously. And at the same time, you wash your face, the ablution, the benefit of it, you actually feel so refreshed, so good, so beautiful. If the doctor were to tell you to do that, you would do so wholeheartedly. Sometimes we don't understand the beauty of the religion is such 
that wallahi, even the health benefits of that salah, the timing, the way we should be uh, washing ourselves, and then forget about everything, go into this place of worship, subhanallah, face a certain direction, and that direction is faced in order to create uniformity. And we say, Allahu Akbar, Allah is the greatest. And we forget everything, starting to talk about the mercy of the Almighty. We've tied our hands, we're looking down, and we're just somewhere else. MashaAllah, spirituality, you need a change, you need a break. It's so good for the mind, so refreshing. After that, MashaAllah, you get back to your work. And then in the afternoon, once again, for the third time. In the evening, as the sun sets, for a fourth time, a fifth time. Amazing, unique. Not only is the timing of the prayer so unique, that... It starts with the beginning of my day and ends with the ending of my own day. But the actions that I am taught to engage in in that particular prayer are such that the English term prayer does not do justice to the exact meaning of salah in the Arabic language. Because if I tell someone I'm praying and they're not Muslim and they had no acquaintance with Islam or the Muslims, they probably wouldn't know what exactly you want to do. I'm allowed to pray in the English language when it comes to supplication. Before my meal, I say, Oh Allah, uh, I thank you for what you've given me and so on. Alhamdulillah, at the end of my meal, I, I, I perhaps thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I can do that in English, I can do it in Arabic, I can do it in any language. When I want something, I supplicate, I'm asking the Almighty, I can raise my hands and ask the Almighty to give me whatever, whatever I, would, I, I wish for in any language. But when it comes to the units of prayer, the units of salah, the five... Uh, prayers of the day it's something totally different you have the standing position you need to stand facing a specific direction you need to remain silent you need to be dressed in a specific way you need to say specific words you need to read from a specific uh, book which means the Quran you need to say the words of declaration of the praise of the Almighty and at the same time when you are finished the standing position, you would actually go to the bowing position known as rukur. The way it is to be done, the way your back is supposed to be straight, and the way you are supposed to be, subhanallah. Today you have a physiotherapist who gives you those exercises and tells you it's important for you, for your back to be this and that. And people don't realize as a Muslim, the beauty of Islam is such, if you read your salah correctly, you will be saved from sicknesses and diseases that you never knew would perhaps have come to your direction had you not been reading your salah correctly. Something amazing, something unique, something beautiful. The same applies when it comes to prostration and when it comes to going into what we know as sujood. It is the only faith, look at the beauty of Islam, the only faith whereby the prostration is exactly as it is, such that it's a position we easily get into and at the same time, the brain which requires oxygenated blood is lower than the heart. So the heart is pumping that oxygenated blood to the brain, which benefits the entire body effortlessly. No effort required because the gravity takes it down. Even if you have a cholesterol problem or if you have, may Allah grant us cure from all the diseases we may be facing and having. But at the same time, the beauty is such that automatically five times a day I take my time in sujood and you know what the hadith says you, you, you th there are adhkar or certain praises of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you utter in sujood and you may utter a lot of the words that were taught by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam take your time don't just dart through that prayer the beauty of the faith is that it will help you to be in that particular position yet the hadith says aqrabu ma yakunul abdu li rabbihi wa huwa sajid the closest that a worshipper is to his or her maker is in the position of prostration. That's an encouragement to say, take your time in that position, you know. Take your time, you will understand. This is beneficial to us in so many ways. My link with the Almighty and at the same time, the beauty of the fact that even my health improves as I engage in that particular uh, posture or I am in that particular position of prayer. This is something amazing and it is part of the beauty of this great religion of Islam. We look at, for example, the faith and the beauty of it, how we reach out not only to the poor from amongst us in terms of the arms to the poor, and arms here, we're speaking of A-L-M-S, not A-R-M-S, you know. We don't want to uh, create war among people. But the charitable deeds that we engage in, the monies that we give, perhaps anything material. And 
Islam says that a charity is not only connected to material items. This is the beauty of Islam. You know what the messenger says? Tabassumuka fi wajhi akhika sadaqa. To smile at the face of your brethren is actually an act of charity. Do you know why? One of the reasons is because it boosts the morale of the people. It makes them feel good. When you smile, people feel okay. You know, if you walk in and you're just so gloomy and you're just looking, everyone becomes gloomy and people are looking. And if you smile, hey, how are you? You know, what's happening? Are you okay? Just break into the smile. Force yourself to smile. See how others will feel good. You will feel good. And that is actually an act of worship. And at the same time, it is contagious. A smile is contagious. If I smile at you, Nine times out of ten, you will have no option but to smile back. Subhanallah. You know, if I look at you with a big smile, what happens? You smile back. And if you don't smile back, guess what I would do? I would have a broader smile. <laughs> MashaAllah, tabarakallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. Sometimes we, are, we feel very low because our expressions are not correct. But the beauty of Islam is such that it deals with our expression as well. So let your expression be a very positive expression because that is part of the beauty of your faith. It will boost you as a human being and it will boost others. And automatically, if others have benefited from that particular smile of yours, you get a full reward for having helped them to have a better day. Subhanallah. So this is called a charitable deed, an act of charity. And from this, we also learn that in Islam, the beauty of a monetary act of charity is that it should not be followed by bragging or by harming someone. And this goes to show that a charitable deed is connected more to the feeling in the heart than the actual material item. When you have the correct sincerity, you're doing it for the right reason, even a small act of charity will go a long way. But if, for example, you might be giving something huge, but your heart is unclean and the way you have given it is such, you know, for example, a person gives you, say for example, a thousand dollars and every day they announce to everyone I gave this guy a thousand dollars the next day I gave this guy a thousand dollars what will you do you'll put it back in an envelope and give it back so when they say I gave him a thousand dollars you say and I gave it back to him <laughs> because it's irritating a human being is such that he does not want to keep on hearing what someone has done for him. You know, I did this guy. It's because of me that you are where you are. What are you talking about? If you really did a charitable deed, don't talk about it. Leave it. The, the hadith speaks about the best of charities being رَجُلٌ تَصَدَّقَ بِصَدَقَةٍ فَأَخْفَاهَا A person who gives out a charity and he hides it. He doesn't make it open. You are allowed sometimes to let the charity be known for encouragement purposes for others. But it stops at that. You don't give out an, a charity openly in order for you to be able to brag about it because the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, there are certain ways that you might negate the reward of the charitable act that you've engaged in. Ya amanu la tubtilu bil manni wal adha. O you who believe, do not nullify the reward of your charities by bragging about it and by harming people thereafter. So you have done a good deed, but you engage in something negative thereafter, you're negating this charitable deed. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us understand the beauty of the faith. I do it, I do it for the sake of the Almighty. I am preparing for the day I meet with the Almighty. And that is also part of the beauty of Islam. Islam teaches us that we are in this world temporarily. That's reality. Nobody can deny that. It's just a temporary abode. Islam teaches us that we will never ever be able to lead a life according to our own desires, whims or fancies. It will always be subject to what the Almighty allows and it will stop at what He disallows. Amazing. That is Islam. And Allah then helps us through Islam to prepare for the day we are going to meet him. And that is definitely coming. You know, when we are young and bubbling with energies and bursting with all these uh, energies that we might have, we tend to forget the fact that death is a reality. Some people prefer not to talk about it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about it and creates the balance. One of the most beautiful things about Islam is that it allows you in fact, it makes incumbent upon you 
to live the world, to earn your livelihood and your sustenance, to enjoy whatever you may want to enjoy on condition that it does not go against the Almighty and it does not make you oblivious of the fact that you have to die one day, you have to meet the Almighty, you have to answer for your deeds and so on. So it's important for us to realize this and understand this. Let me reword this beautiful point. Some people have in, in their faith this notion that if you're a good Muslim, you shouldn't have a nice car, you're not allowed to have a nice phone, you can't be smelling good, you shouldn't be a person who dresses well, you should not be a person who runs after wealth and so on. It's true you don't run after the wealth, but I am a Muslim, I may be a good Muslim, part of my being a good Muslim is for me to engage in my day-to-day -day activities while I'm in this world in such a way that I earn the goodness of the world while preparing for the next. So when I go to work, Allah says you will earn a reward when you fulfill your part of the contract. You know, I go on time. That's the beauty of Islam. If I arrive at work on time, I'm earning a reward from Allah over and above a salary from a person who might be known as my boss. Because I did something that's grand. I'm fulfilling my covenant. I'm fulfilling the contract I have. I gave my word. When I go to work and I excel at work, I'm kind, I'm courteous. I take into consideration the different people. I respect everyone else. I speak to them in a beautiful way. I'm getting a reward from the Almighty over and above the salary that I might be getting by a human being at the end of the month or the end of the week. This is something unique. And this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is Islam. And therefore, there are so many narrations that make mention of the business people and how important it is for us to be able to do business in a way that we will earn the pleasure of the Almighty. At-Tajiru al-Saduq al-Ameen ma'an Nabiyyin wa siddiqeen wa shuhada wa salihin. Which religion teaches us that a businessman who's upright and honest and who does a, a business dealings that are straightforward and so on will be resurrected with the messengers and the pious and those who are really uh, close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no faith that would actually teach us that. It's Islam that tells us you live your life in a beautiful way. And at the same time, you will definitely be able to enjoy your life. And you will be able to earn the pleasure of the Almighty. And at the same time, you will be able to earn heaven and Jannah. And this is why I'd like to end off by making this beautiful prayer. And this is in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed verses and this beautiful verse teaches us quite clearly what is goodness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَن يَقُولُ رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا وَمَا لَهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنْ خَلَاقٍ there are certain people whom when they call out to the Almighty, they pray saying, Oh Allah, grant us goodness of this world. They forget to pray for the life after. They are oblivious of the life after. For some reason, they've just left it. So Allah says, they, what portion do they expect in the hereafter? They will lose their portion of the hereafter. They won't have it. But Allah says, وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَقُولُ رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَةً وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَةً وَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ From amongst them are those who say, Oh Allah, grant us goodness in this world. And grant us goodness in the hereafter and save us from the punishment of the fire. Allah says those are the ones who will achieve the portions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant them. So remember, let us ask Allah for goodness in this world as well as goodness in the next. And let us not forget the portion that Allah has kept for us in this world. But live your life in a beautiful manner. In a manner that would be able to achieve the happiness of the Almighty. As well as the goodness of our own existence while we are in this world. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us every form of goodness. These are just a few aspects of the beauty of Islam that I have chosen to mention this evening. And I hope inshallah we will have another opportunity at some time to speak about the entire faith the entire faith is full of beauty is full of goodness let's make an effort to learn as best as we can and let's ask the Almighty to grant us every form of goodness let's reach out to one another wa sallallahu wa sallama wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad subhanallah wa bihamdihi subhanakallahumma bihamdik nashhadu an la ilaha illa ant nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk